Welcome back to Economics Matters, the podcast. I'm Larry Kotlikoff, your host for today. And um, I'm delighted to have my co-author and longtime friend, Phil Muller, uh, with me to talk about Medicare, everything Medicare. Uh, Phil's probably the top expert in the country on Medicare. Indeed, he's written probably the best book out there on Medicare. It's called Get What Yours for Medicare. Uh, and this book, uh, the title uh, recalls the, the book that he and I and Paul Salmon, who's uh, the economics correspondent for the, the PBS NewsHour, we co-authored a book in 2015 called Get What's Yours, The Secrets to Maxing Out Your Social Security. And uh, that book became a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Indeed, uh, it was... Uh, I think number one for 10 days or so, if I'm correct, Phil, right? And uh, and then it was like for 10 or 11 months in the top 10. So it's pretty amazing. But these rules are very important. Plus, uh, we had a good time. We had put in some humor in the book and Phil d- did as well in his book. But I'm going to, uh, I know something about Medicare, but not enough to tell you anything, for, you know, that's exactly accurate. But Phil knows everything. I'm just going to give a little bit of his background. Uh, but before I do, I want to mention one other thing, which is uh, these decisions about Medicare are really important. So you need to be well educated. We're starting a service at maxify.com, which is you know our my company's um, uh, financial planning software site, and we we set up a service to have a co-pilot if anybody wants to have help uh, onboarding into Maxify and looking at their results get some education on Maxify. We have a, 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 a CFP and also an economics PhD, um, Jay uh, Abelofia, who's uh, providing that service to anybody who wants it. But then we've just signed up Phil uh, to start a service within a couple, probably next week or the week after we'll start, where you can come to our site and, uh, and purchase uh, some education from with Phil one-on-one via Zoom. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions whatsoever about Medicare, Phil's not gonna tell you exactly what to do. That's not part of the service, but he's gonna tell you uh, generally what the story is, give you education. But let me give you a quick uh, rundown on Phil. So Phil's a journalist and primary author uh, in this uh, Get What Yours series. And he's written actually three books uh, He's written the book with me, he written Get What's Yours for Medicare. And then the third book is Get What's Yours for Healthcare, How to Get the Best Care at the Right Price. So he's a three-time Get What's Yours author. And uh, the uh, these are all published by Simon & Schuster, which is, of course is the uh, you know one of the leading uh, publishing companies in, in the country and the world, and one of the oldest in the US. Phil was a reporter for the Charlotte Observer and the Chicago Sun-Times. He was business editor for the Louisville Courier Journal and the Baltimore Sun. And he was editor of the Hartford Business Journal. So he had all these interesting positions in his career. Then uh, that was all before he started writing, which he did for years for US News and World Report and then Money Magazine. And, uh, or maybe I'm not sure whether, which was first, but then also PBS NewsHour. So he's written for a just great, public uh, you know, uh, outlets in the media world. And uh, he's received awards for his writing, including the 1979 uh, Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism uh, for small newspapers. He was a Badgett Fellow in Business and Economics Journalism at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. And he's a graduate of Princeton University and has a master's degree from the Medial School of Journalism at Northwestern University. So Phil's the complete package, but he's also um, our Medicare maven for the day. So Phil, let me start with uh, asking you, what is special about this week? I understand that Medicare uh, enrollment period is uh, upon us. That is Larry, but before I get there, my friends in Louisville would be remiss if I didn't note that it is Louisville, not Louisville. And usually, if you've lived there a long time, it's two syllables. It's Louisville. So it took me a while to learn that. But back to your question. Um, 
Every year, Medicare has what's called an open enrollment period that lets you change your plans if you're a current beneficiary. Uh, gives you a lot of latitude to change your plans. It began October 15th and extends through December 7th. One of the things that I really want to get across to people is that you shouldn't assume that the plan that was good for you in 2022 is still good for you in 2023. These insurance companies are really smart and they game everything. So they change their plans. They change what drugs are in their so-called formulary. So if you have drug coverage, you need to make sure your drug is still covered. They change the tiers in which drugs are priced. There are usually five tiers in a Part D drug plan. And the higher up you get, the more expensive the drugs are. Well, they might move drugs from one tier to another. Um, the good news is that Medicare has all of this data loaded on their website. It's been there as of the beginning of October. And a tool that's generally known as Plan Finder can let you go in and do all this work yourself. And I want to tell people that you need to do this work yourself. You said I don't offer advice and I don't. But what people often want me to do is tell me what to do, Phil. Tell me what to do. And I can't tell them what to do. I don't know what their health situation is. I don't know what their medications are. I don't know what their financial profile is. I don't know what their risk tolerance is. So as an example, Medicare Advantage plans, which are private insurance plans, are starting to dominate Medicare. They're almost half of all Medicare enrollments. They're very attractive for several reasons. One, they're allowed to cover things like dental, hearing, limited vision benefits, uh, home fit, you know, fitness clubs, things that original Medicare by law is not allowed to cover. I believe the insurance company, yeah. they just, did a great job getting that, those rights. Um, and it Jimmy, gives them a, a yeah. step up, go ahead. Let me, just, let me just interject or interrupt for just a second, just to tell people that might not know anything about Medicare and becoming, you know, getting close to the point that they're 65 where they can become, start collecting. Uh, there are these two uh, paths. One is traditional Medicare. And uh, then Phil's talking about Medicare Advantage, which is also called Medicare Part C. Uh, and he's saying that, you know, it, that those private plans uh, that are competing uh, can offer you lots of things that traditional Medicare can offer you. Traditional Medicare is part A, B, and C. A is the hospital part, right, Phil? Yeah, no, it's just A and B. A and B, Ace Hospital, B is doctors, equipment, outpatient services. Right. C, as you alluded, is Medicare Advantage. C is um, Medicare Advantage, not part of the traditional. But D, if you, you want to have health, uh, you want to have drug insurance from A and B. So you're going to need D, which is uh, drug coverage. And right. then in addition, uh, B does not only covers 80% of your out of pocket, uh, out of, of your outpatient costs. So you're going to need a supplemental plan, which we could call G, I guess, right? Um, well, that is one of them, but we can go into that in a little bit. So okay, I'll let you take over. Anyway. That's fine. And, and let me let me roll it back a bit. So as Larry said, there are two traditional, there are two paths into Medicare. The first is traditional or original Medicare, which is parts A and B. A is free to most people. There are no premiums for A if you've worked long enough to collect Social Security. There's an annual premium for part B. Um, 200 bucks ballpark. Um, and then, as Larry said, Part B only covers 80% of your covered claims, your approved claims. So there's something called Medigap Supplement. There are 10 different kinds of Medigap plans. They're each designated by a letter. 
So when Larry said letter G, well, actually G is one of the 10 plants, but there's also A, B, I mean, there's loads of plants. Um, again, Medicare has some good tools online um, to help understand Medigap. They publish an annual guide that goes over the differences in the 10 plans. Key point is these plans are regulated at the state level. And what it means is that insurers are free to charge different amounts for the same letter plan. So everybody who offers a part A, a letter A plan, letter A has to cover the same thing all across the country. You can't, if you're an insurer, you can't freelance. You can add some bells and whistles, but every letter A plan covers the same thing, but it doesn't cost the same. You can see substantial price variations. So lesson one, shop for your Medigap coverage. <laughs> lesson two, uh, again, I don't advise people what to do, but if I didn't have a Medigap plan, I would be walking around in a barrel. Um, my family and I have had some hefty medical expenses and literally with our Medigap coverage, we've had zero out of pocket beyond the Part B premium and an annual deductible. So we do pay the premiums for Medigap supplement and they're not cheap, but if you add them together, we still come out way ahead. With, so let with me that. ask you a quick, quick question. Yeah. A couple of quick questions. First of all, you mentioned uh, the Medicare premium, the basic premium is like 200 bucks a month. But uh, we wanna, I guess, quickly tell people that if you're a higher income, you're gonna have to pay a higher premium. There's, it's a really a progressive tax system. The Medicare Part B premium is not gonna, paying that is not gonna give you more or less Part B coverage. And you have to pay this whether or not you take a Part C, go into Medicare Advantage as well right. as I but, but you would have to pay that anyway. You're right. It doesn't matter because Medicare Advantage has to cover everything that A and B covers. And it has the same kind of high income surcharges. Um, good news, so to speak, is that because of substantial inflation and the increase of the cost of living adjustment, in Social Security, which you well know is 8.7%. That also triggered improvements and lowering of the thresholds for the taxes, the extra premiums you pay as a high income surcharge. Now, only about 7% of Medicare beneficiaries pay the surcharge, but I'm sure all of your followers are in that 7% because only smart people pay attention to what Larry says. So bottom line is it is it is a a penalty you know you know you need to be aware of. Um again, I'm not allowed to give advice, but if I was, there are certain things that a financial advisor could tell you to do to guard yourself against these premiums because they're not graduated. One dollar over the limit, and you're socked with the entire surcharge. And that could be like what, 800, 800 bucks more? Um Probably not that high next year, but if if people are really doing well, and this is based on wage income, not assets. It's an income test, not an asset test. So um, people who are doing really well can, can pay a fairly substantial uh, surcharge. And what I tell my disgruntled readers, and nobody likes to pay the surcharge. Nobody hates it. I mean, they, they, nobody likes it. And I sort of say, well, I agree with you. But it's sort of a nice problem to have because if you're paying this surcharge, it means your income is doing well enough to trigger it, the surcharge. Even with that surcharge, nobody pays the going rate for what it actually costs to provide Part B services. The government subsidizes even the wealthiest people in this country. Yeah, let me just uh, say, you know, we have Medicare Part B premiums programmed to Maxify Planner. And one of the, there's two crazy things about Medicare Part B premiums. First of all, it's not really a premium. It's just a tax. Uh, secondly, it's a progressive tax. So yes, if you're low income, it's going to be 200 or so. Uh, but then as Phil was saying, if your income goes above, there's like four thresholds. And the, uh, uh, if you go, if you have a dollar too much and you pass into the next threshold, 
it's not like you pay some fraction of that extra dollar, but rather you can pay an extra, as far as I understand it, uh, as I recall, around 800 bucks going from one threshold to another. Uh, so the, the other thing that I know you know, Larry, is that there also are um, support systems for low-income Medicare beneficiaries that help you with the Part B and also help you with your drug expenses. Um, 15, 20% of people on Medicare take advantage of those benefits because as you know, many older Americans don't have a lot of money. Um, so oh, let me ask you on that. Is, do you have to be enrolled in Medicaid in effect to get that help? Not or always. Most people are so-called dual enrollees. They're in Medicare and Medicaid, but there may be some people who don't qualify for Medicaid, but still might qualify for some extra help. And what I, what I suggest people do, there's a terrific public program of trained Medicare consultants who will talk to you for free. It's a government program. It's called the State Insurance Assistance Program. Um, the acronym is SHIP. They have a website. Um, this program is sadly underused, but people who don't know what to do and don't want to use our services, um, they can go and use this free service. And um, the people there are supposedly trained every year in Medicaid certified programs to try to stay up to snuff on what the rules are. Okay. It's, a great, it's, it's a good resource. One other thing to tell everybody is that um, in addition to this, uh, I said that there are two kind of crazy things about uh, this uh, Medicare premium tax, which is just a tax, which is Part B premium. You know, you earn an extra, you, you have an extra dollar, uh, all of a sudden you're paying an extra 800 bucks over the course of the year or something like that. The other thing is that that calculation of what threshold you're in is based on your, as I understand it, a measure of your uh, income, which is called modified adjusted gross income. And there's different magis and modified adjusted gross income concepts, depending on what what the federal income is trying, income tax is trying to hit you or, or the federal uh, government is trying to hit you up for. But anyway, they calculate uh, a measure of modified adjusted gross income two years uh, before you're getting your paying your Medicare Part B premium. So if I'm 65, they're going to look at my MAGI back when I'm 63 and decide what Medicare Part B bracket I'm in based on what happened at 63. And then when I'm 66, they're going to look at what my MAGI was at 64. It's always two years back. So it's a retroactive. Now, when Phil said uh, you can, you know, be savvy and try and impact your Medicare Part B premiums, well, you can do that by, you know, for example, if you take Social Security early at 63, for example, now you may be kicking up your uh, Medicare Part B premiums, and you'll see this right in Maxify Planner when you run it. Or if you do like a Roth conversion. Uh, and you withdraw money from an IRA to put into a Roth, that can also kick up your MAG, as I understand. Anyway, the software uh, gets this 100% correct, and uh, you can see whether doing X, Y, or Z is actually going to make cost you and how much it will cost you to the dollar in extra Medicare Part B premiums. You can see in black and white. Anyway, let's go Let's go on and uh, talk more from let me, let me get back into that, but I want to put a little asterisk in what you were saying. Okay. The reason there's a two-year lag is because the IRS has to ship the taxpayer files to Social Security. Social Security is the agency that determines these high-income surcharges. So because your 2020 income wasn't filed until 2021, it takes the agency a year to get these files over to Social Security and have them processed. So the two-year lag is not because anybody has fallen down on the job. It just takes that long. The asterisk here is that should you file late, should you extend your filing until October from April, you may have a three-year lag because your income won't be picked up 
on that two year cycle. So just just saying that, you know, you get together with your financial advisor and you say, well, it's really worth it to me. I want to hold off a third. You know, I want to not get counted until year three. It's possible that that would happen. I don't know that there are any guarantees, Larry, but I've been told by many people that they actually have a three year lag. And I think the common element is that they file late. Oh, OK, so let me get back into the basic choice. So we've gone over traditional Medicare. One thing that people should know is that the, the real strong appeal of traditional Medicare is that you can use any medical provider in the United States who accepts Medicare. You don't need prior approval. You don't need a referral. You literally, if you need a covered procedure and you want to go to Dr. X and he or she happens to be 800 miles away, doesn't matter. You're covered under your Part A and B. Let's flip now to Medicare Advantage, which I'll talk about. But Medicare Advantage, by contrast, requires you to use providers in the plan's network. By doing this, they can substantially lower costs because they negotiate contracts with all these providers. And so you're dealing with huge insurance company, which has a lot of marketplace leverage, and they can reach a pretty good deal with a doctor's practice or a hospital to get better rates than you would be able to get using traditional Medicare. The, the flip side of that is that if you go on a network, you may pay hefty penalties for going on a network for care. In some cases, they won't cover you on a network. The other thing is, because this is a managed care program, there are a lot of prior authorization requirements if you want to get a procedure. Original Medicare, you don't need prior authorization in most cases. You just, if it's covered by Medicare, you can go ahead and do it. Um, but in Medicare Advantage, you do need to get prior approvals. Um, in some cases, a good idea. You would like somebody to review your medical needs. Um, but in other cases, it's a big hassle. So the other thing about Medicare Advantage, because they drive all these good bargains, is that these plans are much cheaper usually than traditional Medicare. If you don't, you don't need a Medicare supplement plan because Medicare Advantage plans have an out-of-pocket maximum for health expenses. It, it can range from two to three to up to seven or eight thousand um, dollars. But you don't you cap your exposure. Again, they cover things that original Medicare does not cover. Um, many of them have what are called zero premium pan plans. And all I would tell people is what you pay for health care is a lot more than just a premium. So don't shop based on an attractive premium. The good thing about Plan Finder that I alluded to before is that it will give you estimated costs for all these plans based on the medications you take. So you enter your formulary online and it goes through all these plans and it prices it. Is this Plan Finder a product you have to pay for? Is this a program? No, nope. it's a Medicare.gov plan. It's free. I also urge people to create their own My Medicare account. Most people on Medicare do this. Medicare wants you to do this. And your My Medicare account actually is usually loaded with your formulary for the drugs you take. And it, it usually has the information on the plan you're already in. And so it already has sort of priced that out. And you can go online and say, well, show me what else is available in my zip code. So um, it's really, a, it's a very good resource. So going back to open enrollment, during this period you have, again, we've gone through the traditional pathways, regular Medicare or Medicare Advantage. Usually both have a Part D plan. With original Medicare, you might get a Medigap supplement plan as well. Once you've done this, it's really important during open enrollment to price these out and make sure you're making an informed decision because during open enrollment, you can switch from original Medicare to Medicare Advantage. You can switch from Medicare Advantage to original Medicare. You can change your Part D coverage. You can, you can keep Medicare Advantage, but get a different plan. 
most counties on average have three dozen different Medicare Advantage plans and they have as many Part D plans. So there's a lot of choice out there. Um, the one thing I would warn people again about is that switching from Medicare Advantage back to Original Medicare, should you want a Medigap plan, insurers are often not legally required to sell you a plan on ad advantageous underwriting terms. When you originally qualify for Medicare, you have guaranteed access to Medigap um, and can't be underwritten, can't have your rates raised because of your age or pre-existing condition. That expires six months after you're Medicare eligible. So my suggestion, I have to be careful about the advice word to hear, Larry, but my suggestion is that before you consider switching from Medicare Advantage back to original Medicare, call Medigap insurers. Make sure that they will let you do this. Make sure you understand the prices they would pay. Again, Plan Finder has a section for Medigap, but it doesn't, it assumes that you're um, you have advantageous access. So yeah. you need you need to call these brokers. Um, I mean, uh let me make, uh, this is really one of the most important things. So if I go to the, so pretend I go down the, the path of uh, uh, Medicare Part C, the Advantage route, and uh, now all of a sudden I get some, uh, some disease that's uh, uh, where I want to see some specialists in the other part of the country, and it's not covered by my plan, it's not in network. So if I go uh, and uh, see that doctor over there, I'm going to be paying a lot of out-of-pocket expenses. So I decide in October, open enrollment series time, I'd like to switch back to, Me switch to Medicare traditional. And now I'd want to, and now I've got this pre-existing condition and I need not just A, B, and D, which is the drug benefit, A is hospitalization, B again is outpatient doctor care, D is the drug benefit, but I'm going to need one of 10 different Medigap Medi 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 supplemental policies. There's like 10 different ones I can choose from, but each one of them might say, well, you've got this pre-existing condition, so we're not going to charge you this, the, low, the low price per year, per month that we would charge somebody who's just coming into Medicare the first, you know, from scratch. We're going to charge you based on your pre-existing condition, and we could charge you an arm and a leg, I guess, right? Yeah, not. It's not always an arm and a leg. I don't want to say that's always the case, but it could be. And again, um, we're talking about an extra five thousand dollars a year. What, what kind of? What's the biggest horror story here? You know, people have to um, about. I I think that um, the biggest horror story is people who couldn't get the policy at all because the insurers are not legally required to sell this to you in many cases once this guaranteed access period has ended. So that's that the worst access, story. Is that guaranteed access period, uh, how long is that? Is that just like in the first year when you, when you or the it's, first time you thought? It's of six months after you enroll in Medicare. Again, most people enroll at 65, but if you still work at 65 and you're covered by an employer plan, you don't enroll till 68, let's say, you get that six month period when you enroll at age 68. So that's this guaranteed access period. Um, and uh, again, I would say we're, we're certainly talking several thousand dollars more a year um, in terms of a possible worst case. It could be it's still a bargain for you, right? Um, but I just want people to be aware of. You're also saying I might not, if I waited like seven months to sign up for my uh, medic, let's say I go take traditional A, B, and D, and uh, and then I wait seven months because I'm just not getting around to getting the Medigap plan. And then I go and they say, well, what's your pre existing condition? So it could cost me a whole lot more if I just wait that extra month uh, because I wasn't aware that I had to move quickly. Now, let me ask you this question. So you're saying, if I go into Medicare C, if I go into Advantage, and then I want to switch back to traditional, now it's like beyond the six month uh, uh, period. Now I'm going to get hit with extra costs because of pre-existing conditions. But 
here's my second, my other question, which is suppose I get in under the window, right when I first sign up for Medicare, I go the traditional route, I get a Medigap plan that's um, at a, you know, at a charge, which, which charges me not based on my uh, initial conditions, there's no underwriting, that's what it means to be uh, charged based on your pre-existing conditions, that's what underwriting is referring to. Uh, so there's no underwriting. I get a good, I get a plan for a decent price, but then I decide I don't like the plan or they change the, the Medigap plan and I'm still in traditional Medi Medicare and uh, I want to change my Medigap plan. Can Medigap, can they now charge me based on my pre-existing condition? They, they can. They have the ability to underwrite you if you're changing plans. Um, so this is like a lifetime decision Really, if you want to have a low Medigap, uh, uh, yeah, if you uh, and you know, if you're worried about uh, about getting charged a higher premium because of pre-existing condition, you kind of have to make a lifetime decision right from the get-go. It's uh, important. Um, the one good thing about Medigap is that if you sign up for it during this period you are guaranteed renewal for the rest of your life. You can't be kicked off this plan. It's the law, as they say. There are a number of legislative proposals that would try to change this. There are a lot of people who feel that Medigap re-enrollment rules are unnecessarily punitive, um, especially for people on Medicare who qualify based on disability and need a Medigap plan, the Medigap guaranteed access is only for people 65 and older. So if you're disabled and you're 53 years old and you need a Medigap plan, good luck. I mean, by definition, you have a pre-existing condition. And so it can be very hard for you to get that Medigap plan if you wanna do it, if you're disabled. Um, also, again, another asterisk, there are some states that have slightly different rules, which is why I urge people to do some homework, um, get Medicare's Medigap Supplement Annual Report, which is available free online, you can download it, and it'll have state-by-state -state wrinkles in it if there are any that affect you. Are some states better than others in this area? Or do some states... Uh, yes, yes, they they are, and I, I hate to go so far in the weeds, but um, this is what I do for a living. The Kaiser Family Foundation, which is to me the gold standard of healthcare data and research, they're terrific. Their stuff is understandable. It's professionally done. It's comprehensive. They did a great Medigap report a few years ago that looked at all fifty states and D.C. and told you exactly how they're regulations differ so that you could get a really good idea of how you'd be treated if you were a resident of that state. Um, you know, that I don't know if people can remember, but their website is kff.org. Go there, put in Medigap or Medicare supplement, and you will find your way to this report. It's a few years old, but it's still, it's the only thing I've seen that really provides this great soup to nuts comparison of each individual state. Okay, uh, and when we put up your, uh, you know, your page describing uh, your service, uh, your Medicare coach service for Maxify, uh, for for the company, for you know, it's going to be uh, something you can purchase. Uh, time with Phil, educational time at uh, Maxify.com. We will put up um, on the page describing the service. We'll put up a link to that uh, publication and and anything else that you think is. Uh, useful for people. The um, so so suppose you're uh, Phil. Let me ask you this question: Suppose you're just turned sixty-five. You're retired. Uh, you're living in uh, uh, any of the states. Uh, I take it the Medigap plan that you can the Medigap plans are being avail are made available uh, are nationwide. So. If I'm in Tennessee, I can get uh, maybe United Healthcare, uh, even though 
And if I'm in Nebraska, I can get United Healthcare as a Medigap plan. Usually, so, usually you can. Insurers that offer Medigap do not necessarily have to offer all 10 letter plans. They have some options about which plans they offer. Again, but if they offer you know, a plan B or a plan G, um, it has to be the same across the country. So you may have to do a little shopping if you want a certain letter plan, um, but these plans are available. Believe me, insurers, <laughs> insurers are in business to sell product. And so you'll be able to find it. And and the, uh, these you said there's these 10 different letters, A, A to whatever. Um, right. Uh, how much do they differ? If I go for the G versus the A, I mean, is the coverage dramatically different? And it can I, be substantially different, yes. I, I can't give a general rule because it depends on your health needs in terms of, but, but Plan G today for new Medicare beneficiaries provides the most comprehensive coverage. It literally covers everything except your Part B deductible. So once you pay your Medigap premium, the only thing you're really on the hook for is that deductible, which I said is only a couple hundred bucks, um, a few uh, hundred it bucks. Be a couple, it can be much more if you're high income, right? Uh, not the deductible. No, this is not the premium. This is just the deductible. Deductible oh, is, oh, the deductible. is yeah, okay. has no class consciousness. It's the same for everybody. So okay. not a problem. Um, but I will tell you that uh, our family has had really stiff medical expenses, um, including taking a drug that retails for $72,000 a dose. Oh my God. We pay zero because that drug is administered on an outpatient basis. So it's not covered on part D, it's covered on part B. So we don't pay anything because plan G fulfills the entire gap. And so, yes, we pay, we pay higher premiums because we have a good plan. But as you what know- are you, What are you paying for your, uh, for your Medigap plan? Um, I pay, our, our household, my wife and I pay about 360 a month. That's weighted a little bit heavier to me because I'm older. So say I pay 190 and she pays 170 a month. So 12 times 190 is what? You know, 2200 bucks a year, give or take. Um, so I pay that in addition to my Part B premium, but everybody has to pay Part B. So, so my maximum out of pocket is 2200 plus the annual deductible. So say it's 2500. Very few Medicare Advantage plans have an out of pocket that low. I see. So, if, okay. if I could sit down with a person and, and explain to them exactly what I explained to you, uh, my friends at Medicare Advantage plans would be very unhappy with me. <laughs> right. But of course, we're not, we're just educating. We're not advising. Uh, we're, we're right. But there are consequences to what you do. And I, I think it's important people make informed decisions. So. So, so just in your case, you're paying like 2,500 bucks a year. And if you didn't have this, if you didn't have any Medigap coverage, or if you had, let's say, the A coverage rather than the G coverage, you could be facing hundreds of thousands of dollars. You could be facing $500,000 of cost a year if I'm reading. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think even with A, I would be spared that horrific consequence. I haven't priced it out. I have enough time keeping up with my own bills rather than doing scenarios on what I would pay if I had part A or letter A or letter B. Um, obviously the big, the big one is if you have no Medigap and Larry, a lot of Medicare beneficiaries have original Medicare with no Medigap. I would say less than half of traditional Medicare enrollees have Medigap. Why? They can't afford it. Wow. So they're really at risk for being wiped out. A lot, a lot of exposure. Although you would say in this case, given that the typical household can't scrape together 400 bucks, which that's what the surveys have said, um, I'm not going to lose sleep over the fact that I can't afford an expensive Medigap plan because I'm not going to pay this bill anyway. Um, so you're saying you're going to Medicaid if this happens. If you're, if... 
realistically, many people wouldn't go on Medicaid unless medical debt wiped out all of their resources. But even if it did, if their income was high enough, they might still have problems going on Medicaid. It depends on the state they live in. Medicaid, as you know, is both an income and an asset test program. So you have two, two barriers, two, two hurdles you have to deal with there. Nasty work, you know, if you have too much in assets and a dollar too much in assets, you can lose your coverage. Uh, you can even lose ch coverage for children if you're poor. And uh, when we're talking about older people, but the supply of support people. Um, and, yeah, we, we need to do a much better, let me take a step back. I think these are good insurance programs. I think we're lucky as a nation to have them. But what we don't do is educate people about how to use them. We spent, and I, you know, you and I have been through this a lot with Social Security. Social Security spends more than a trillion dollars a year in benefit payments. Their communications budget is like, their advertising budget was $10 million. I can't even calculate what a small, what a small decimal that is. And so if we could figure out a way to it just sort of acknowledge the complexity of modern day benefit programs, we need to do a much better job of communicating with people. And I would say in all confidence that if you gave me $100 million to educate people about Medicare, I would save the taxpayer more than $100 million. We would come out ahead because people would make smarter decisions. They wouldn't expose themselves to inappropriate coverages and uh, medical debts would improve. It would just be, you know, so let's let's advocate for the know what you're getting act and, you know, fund this thing. Give you $100 million. I'm going to, okay. I promise I'll make good use of it, Larry. <laughs> Put that bill through Congress. The, uh, so can, Medi can the Medigap plan uh, be changed on you? I mean, you get this coverage, it's, you start out, you start no, at this thing for life. You can't. The, the, the coverages, even though the plans are regulated at the state level, the coverages that they must offer are mandated at the federal level. Now, sure, you could change legislation, but I, I just, I mean, Congress can't even agree on what day of the week it is. So I expecting any any material improvement in, you know, or, or change in that. No. So so I think to the extent that you can ever feel somewhat secure. If you have a Medigap plan you like, just grin. I mean, mine goes up a little bit every year. It, it's not frozen, saying, but I mean, I started seven years ago, and my our premiums were like maybe two fifty, and now they're three and a quarter. So what's that? Ten bucks a year? I'll take it. <laughs> right. Ten bucks a month a year. Yeah. So, in general, let me ask this question: If you're if you're going to take a are some states much, if, well, if I'm retiring and I'm thinking about what state to move to, maybe I'm gonna downsize or I'm trying to find a state that's less expensive. Uh, are there some states that you would, you know, on this issue of Medicare, uh, availability of plans and availability of, and, and rules that are more protective of people, are there some states that are better than others? Is, Massachusetts a lot a lot better than Kentucky. Um, that's absolutely the right question. I have never seen a good study, Larry. I've been begging people to do this kind of work, and I haven't seen it. My general thinking is that, as with all insurance products, the degree of professionalism and vigilance of a state insurance department is a good thing. And so there are some state insurance departments, you know, traditionally California was one of them. They were very proactive, very pro-consumer, and they paid attention to these things. So um, again, um, I, don't, I don't know that Medigap should ever be a basis on where you live. Um, but yeah, there may be some differences, um, but I think it's marginal. I don't... Um, Let's talk about a couple other things here uh, that people I think need to to know about. Suppose I'm, um, uh, you know, I, I let's say I'm working for an employer. The employer has to have twenty or more 
employees for me not to have to uh, start paying Medicare Part B premiums. So maybe I'm in my employer plan. He's got, the employer's got, uh, she or he has, my employer has uh, 10 employees. Uh, so, and I'm going along here. I go from 65, 66, I keep working, 68, 69. Suddenly uh, I get laid off or whatever. I can't work, I decide to retire. I go and sign up for Medicare. Uh, uh, maybe I start taking Social Security at that point. I take uh, get Medicare Part A, Medicare Part B, and now I get a premium bill that has a big penalty because I didn't sign up for Medicare Part B when I was 65 because I was in within the, the reason I'm going to get hit with this surcharge is because I was working for an employer with fewer than 20 employees. Correct. Nope, not quite correct. Okay, fix me. What it, what it means is that you work for an employer with 15 covered employees. You're about to turn 65. At that point, the employer does not have to continue offering you employer insurance. They can say to you, you need to take Medicare because we're a small employer. If they do continue... People think that that's an absolute requirement, but it's not. If you, as an employer, want to keep offering Medicare or keep offering employer plans, you can do that. The reason Medicare helps small employers is because it can be a financial burden to offer employer health insurance. So this is an acknowledgement that we want to encourage people to keep working past 65 and their employers shouldn't pay the price for that. So if the small employer wants to move them, the point is, is that you shouldn't have a gotcha situation like you described. You will know whether your employer is going to drop you from their plan or not, because the employer has an obligation to tell you that. But if I thought they, I thought if you are working for an employer with fewer than 20 employees, and tell me if I'm wrong here, that you get hit with a surcharge if you uh, when you finally do sign up for Medicare Part B. That's not true. No, no, it's only um, the o the only again. If you continue to be offered employer coverage, yeah. you don't have to sign up for Medicare until that coverage ends. You get a special enrollment period. For some reason, it's not seven months, Larry. It's eight months. I don't know the extra month. What is leap year? I don't know. Um, so that's. Then if you fail to sign up on a timely basis, you can get hit with late enrollment penalties. I think the big issue here is that people don't pay attention to the rules and that includes sometimes some smaller employers. So unfortunately, it's a buyer beware system, which you and I have discussed is the way it is with social security. Um, if you don't know the rules, you can be, you can lose a lot. Um, and again, the, the the title of the first chapter of my Medicare book was No One Told Me. And so I tell people it doesn't, you know, and, and this was from um, a uh, really skilled corporate attorney who thought, like a lot of smart people, I know how to navigate sophisticated systems. I think Medicare is a snap. And they just got hammered. They had all sorts of penalties. They never knew. It was deer in the headlights time. And so I urge people to do their homework. So, so I, re I turned 65. I'm working with my, let's say I, I, uh, my employer stops covering me. And uh, I take my good old time, maybe, maybe four or five months to uh, uh, enroll in uh, maybe A and uh, and B, let's say now I might have to, uh, well, I've got, you said a six, seven month window or something. It's an eight month window. So okay. again, anyway, let's suppose that I don't, I take eight months. Right. And I get sick in between. I've got no coverage from my employer. I haven't signed up for Medicare. Right. I have to pay those, all those bills, right? And right. I so, so I tell people, well, I know you're worried about these late enrollment penalties, but forget the late enrollment. Your big risk is having a medical crisis with no insurance. 
So why would you ever wait for your Medicare to take effect after your employer insurance ends? Some people say, oh, I can get COBRA, which is an insurance plan for people who leave their work. Well, that sounds nice, but COBRA policies don't provide primary coverage for Medicare eligible recipients. That's one of these little asterisks that, so you might think I can get COBRA and I'll be covered, but you won't be. That's really important. So this is really a, a huge danger. Uh, if you're, so really a big red flag here, we should, people should know that if their, uh, if their employer coverage stops, they have to immediately, they have to enroll in Medicare before it stops. They have to anticipate this and get themselves in either advantage or traditional. And if it's traditional, it's going to be A, B, C, A, B, D, and one of these Medigap plans from A to G. And yeah. probably you want, if you can afford it, the G because uh, you could have astronomical bills that are not covered by your supplemental plan. Well, yeah, for, okay. for me, for me, Larry, G is what I call the head on the pillow test. I just know what my exposure is. I know what I'm going to pay. I have the stability of planning. Um, and yeah, I have the good fortune to be able to afford a letter G plan. But to me, it's the gold standard. I love Medicare Advantage plans for some people. They're cheaper, especially if you're younger and you're healthy. You don't take a lot of drugs. You don't have pre-existing conditions. Um, it can be a very sensible to get a Medicare Advantage plan. You can save, let's say you're in a, a very good Medicare Advantage plan versus mm -hmm. traditional and you're relatively healthy. Uh, so you don't have to pay the Medigap. You don't have to, the, the D would be, the drug coverage would come with a, the Medicare Advantage plan? Yeah, um, and many of those have very low or even zero premium drug plans. Point is, if you're healthy and you don't take drugs and you don't have medical expenses to speak of, Medicare Advantage plans are going to cost you almost nothing except your Part B premium, which everybody has to pay. Um, and they offer you hearing, vision, dental. Um, they can be a pretty good deal, which is one of the reasons they've grown. There's no co-pays or deductibles or co-insurance? Well, they do. But remember, we've posited that our person doesn't have much in the way of health care. Um, a lot of them will include an annual physical. You don't pay anything for that. Um, Medicare has a number of guaranteed services that provide no copay responsibility. And Medicare Advantage has to follow those rules. Remember, by law, they have to cover everything that A and B covers. So if, if you know, if Part B says, well, if you want to get this vaccine, it's free. Well, Medicare Advantage has to make it free as well. Okay, so so here's my next question, which is, uh, if you go to Medicare Advantage, do all the Medicare Advantage plans have drug plans as part, drug coverage as part of that or not? Or do you need- Almost, almost all of them bundle in what's called bundle in a Part D plan. See, one of the other advantages of Medicare Advantage is that if you're in traditional Medicare, your basic claims are handled by the government. Your drug claims are handled by another insurer. Your Medigap claims are handled by a third insurer. You got a lot of paper floating around. Medicare Advantage, one statement. It's all bundled together. So for ease of administrative management, that's another little advantage that Medicare Advantage plans have. So I should tell everybody that um, Phil has a, an excellent uh, Substack newsletter. It, Tell us the, uh, the URL for that on Medicare. Wow. I don't know if I have time to call it up, Larry. But let me just say, if you Google me and okay. Google Substack, you'll get there. Um, if you don't, when Larry posts this, he's going to put my email address on, molar.philip at gmail.com. 
And if he, if you see that email address and you have a question about how to get access to this, just send me an email. I'll be happy to answer it. As Larry also knows, I have a fairly substantial website that is password protected that has 100,000 words of Medicare advice on it. I'm sorry, Medicare education <laughs> that that you can get access to if you're a paid subscriber of my Substack newsletter. Uh, I maintain this so that it's current all the time because these rules change and wouldn't it be nice to go to a place where you know when you access it, it's current. Um, well, that's one of the things I've done with this site. And um, I can guarantee people that my subscription charges so far have only um, succeeded to the extent that I've covered my internet hosting bills. <laughs> right. Larry's used to working for free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, I also yeah, should put in a plug. Feel free to subscribe to uh, this uh, Substack uh, podcast and the newsletter if you'd like. Uh, but the um, that's not the main. The main idea is to really uh, protect people, help people have the knowledge to uh, make sure they don't get into these huge traps that the government, you know, Phil is much more, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, nice, much nicer to the, in terms of describing the government's behavior with respect to Social Security and Medicare and so many of the other programs. I think, I think the government is trapping people um, left, right, and center in these programs because they've made them so complicated and uh, that we are in enormous financial risk unless we have uh, the education that we need. So that's why you know I helped develop uh, with my teammates, my company, our maxify.com program, our maximizemuscleskitty.com tool, which is 40 bucks to figure out uh, what you should yeah. do with the security or help you figure out. Uh, well, as Larry, as Larry and I know, Yep. If you don't get Social Security right and you don't get Medicare right, all the financial planning in the world might not help you. The, these are what I call the two bookends of the successful later life or retirement. You've got to get these pieces right. And the tools are out there to do that. Um, and I think our challenge is to lead people to drink the water that is already available for them in terms of understanding how to make an informed decision. Uh, but but the answer is not tell me what to do. Um, that's that's like none of the above in the multiple choice question. Um, you need to learn enough to get a solution that's tailored to your needs. And again, in the case of Medicare, this is a very flexible insurance tool that I think you can create a solution that is very good for you and your family and your health profile. But it's not one size fits all. You know, employer plans have maybe one or two choices. Medicare Advantage, three dozen different plans, three dozen different Part D plans. This is harder stuff. And sometimes people don't understand when they move from the world of employer coverage to Medicare that it's sort of like you're in a whole new world now. You need to know more. You got to do your homework. You're going back to school. And half the people are, as I get it, as, as I understand it, uh, half of new enrollees are going into Medicare Advantage and half are going into tr traditional, or maybe it's 40, 60, but... It, it's even more than half going into new. What's happened is the weighted average is nearly half of Medicare Advantage. Well, given that it was zero 15 years ago, in order to get to half, you have to have well over half of the enrollments and renewals go into Medicare Advantage to raise that percentage. Right. Okay, so uh, this has been really terrific. It's an eye opener for me. I thought I knew a fair about, amount about um, Medicare, uh, but I learned a whole lot just talking to you today, and I'm sure the, uh, the listeners have as well. So I want to really thank you a lot, Bill, for um, conveying this info. And, and again, there's going to be, um, Phil is going to be at, at maxify.com uh, in about a week or so. You'll be able to uh, Click on uh, sign up, pay or sign in, or we'll say uh, yeah, sign up, and you'll see on our uh, page where we market the software and market 
our co-piloting service for Maxify Planner uh, and our, we also have uh, uh, expert reviews of your use of both of the two tools. They're up for, uh, that service is a lot less expensive than co-piloting, but then we also are gonna feature Phil, the Medicare coach, and he's gonna provide educational advice to you personally by Zoom. Uh, no, no, not advice, education, but no advice. <laughs> he's not gonna tell you what to do. He's gonna tell you how to think about your options and uh, so that you don't miss anything. Uh, but the most uh, important takeaway today is that you need to be educated, you need to be informed because we've already today in the last hour gone through some horrific scenarios that you could fall, uh, you, could, you could be trapped into paying huge amounts of money if you don't uh, take uh, care to uh, deal with this, uh, the signing up on time and uh, also making sure you uh, sign up for the right thing that's gonna work for you. So Phil, Thank you again. Great to see you again. And uh, we will be talking. Take care. You're welcome, Larry. It's my pleasure. Take care. Ciao, ciao.